Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You are listening to It's All About Food. And we're having a little party here. I'm here with my partner, Gary DiMatte. Gary, woo! Woo, Karen, yes. What are we having a party for? We're celebrating. We are celebrating the best vegan food podcast to listen to right now. USA Today's top 10 best and guess who's on the list? Me! <laughs> I can't it's believe it. It's all about food produced by Responsible Eating and Living. That's us. It's all about food brings listeners up-to-date news about food and our food systems. Broadcast since 2009 and hosted by Karen Hartglass, the informative program aims to help listeners live better, kinder lives. Hart Glass, who has lived a vegan lifestyle since 1988, does in-depth interviews with everyone from medical doctors to cookbook authors, poets, athletes, activists, nutritionists, food manufacturers, environmentalists, and food scientists. It's All About Food broadcasts live from Manhattan on the Progressive Radio Network. Woo-hoo! Woo, thank you for reading that, Gary. Absolutely. After, I'm after... so proud to read it because I'm so proud of you and all of the work that you do, that you tirelessly do on the scene and behind the scenes with your veg podcast. I've been doing this for 14 years and it's nice once in a while to be recognized. I have to say, I don't do this for recognition. I do this for one reason and one reason only. I like to say I'm here to make vegans. I am here to reduce pain and suffering caused by exploitation of animals. And humans are involved in this too, because we know the animal industry in particular is devastating for people to work in. There was just a recent article in in the New York Times about children immigrants that are being employed under age in these dangerous work environments in the animal industry that's because the people that are raising animals and slaughtering animals for food are doing it for profit and they don't care about animals and they don't care about people but now i'm getting all excited right no <laughs> but, but that's you have why to we're here. you have to point this out that's why we're here exactly we really don't want to harm animals. We don't want to harm people in the process of harming am animals. And that's what's happening a lot. And it's also harming other folks indirectly, folks that don't work in slaughterhouses and really messing with your health. That's what you're here for. You're here to let everybody know that there's a kinder way. There's a gentler way. And a more delicious way. And a more delicious way. <laughs> and a cruelty-free way. I want to thank... My listeners who have been listening to this program either since 2009 or whenever you started tuning in. And I also want to thank and welcome the people my, who might be tuning in for the first time because they saw the USA Today 10 Best article. By Robin Raven, which was out on September 19th, 2023. It's an excellent Excellent piece in USA Today. We're really, really happy here at Responsible Eating and Living. And it's all because of you, Karen, all the hard work that you do. And you're in some great company with some great folks who have great podcasts too. So check out all of the podcasts. They're all wonderful, wonderful podcasts. But I happen it, to think that this one is the best, but that's thank just you. me. I had that's heard from me. somebody recently saying that they had spoken with one of my competitors and they were talking about one of the people who was in this list. And I said, we are not competitors. We are all on the same side. We all have the same mission. And all of our podcasts are, are unique. We all put a different spin on things. So I welcome people to listen to whatever rings true to them. But one thing I'm going to ask everyone right now, and then I'm going to get on with the program today because we've got some great guests and I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about. I want to ask everyone to share this program. Talk about it, share it, because it's all part of the activism that we're doing. And this is 
one place where people can get a wide range of information that can help them move forward to a less exploitive, more compassionate life. Absolutely. And please share this article as well in USA Today. Share. It's all about food and share this article and share the message that plants are delicious, nutritious, so, so, so great for the animals if you eat plants and not eat them. And it's great great. for the planet. It's great for the planet. Everybody start eating plants today. (laughs) More plants. More plants. Eat more plants. So I know you have a great show today, Karen, and I'm going to get out of the way so you can take this thing to the next level. Congratulations. It's been great being here with you for this, these few minutes. Thanks for inviting me on. Of course. Well, you've been with me the whole way here since 2009 in the background, in the foreground, as a guest, as a co-host, and just as my muse for inspiration. (laughs) And I'm very grateful for that. I love you, Karen. And we'll get mushy, mushy, mushy. (laughs) Okay, Gary. Love you. you. Bye. Congratulations and have a great show today. Okay. All right. One more thing before we get started with the main topic today. The Progressive Radio Network offers an option to hear programs live by phone over Xeno Radio. So you can listen to this program and others by dialing 641-741-2308. And if you're new to the program or you want to catch up on the most recent five episodes of It's All About Food, by phone, you can call my personal archive number, 701-719-0885. Now, for some people, listening to a podcast over a phone is not a big deal, but there are many people who may not have access to a computer, or may not have a smartphone, or perhaps have limited cellular network service, but have unlimited phone service. So it really is beneficial for many people. It's a very popular thing, and I'm excited that we're able to offer that. Now, our program today is about vegan discrimination cases. And I recently connected with Tamara Bedish and She shared with me some very interesting cases that I thought would be a good topic for this program. Today, we're going to be speaking with two people and discuss cases they were involved with in the past. And then we will bring Tamara back with a few other people who have some ongoing cases in another podcast episode. And this isn't just in the United States. These things are happening all over the world. Now... I'd like to introduce my guest for today. I'm here with Tamara Bedish, Jerry Friedman, and Jordi Kasamijana. And I want you to know a little bit about each of them, and then we'll get into some more detail. Tamara Bedish Esquire is an ethical vegan animal rescuer and employment attorney. Jerry Friedman Esquire is an ethical vegan animal rights activist and California attorney. And Jordi Casamijana is an ethical vegan activist and author of The Ethical Vegan. Welcome, all of you. I am also an ethical vegan, so it's nice to sit together for a moment with some ethical vegans and have a conversation. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And just for a moment, while we're talking about ethical vegans, does anybody want to clarify why we need to add that adjective to vegan? Take it away, Jordy. Well, since my book is called Ethical Vegan, I think I ought to do that. Uh, well, I think a vegan is a term that's been used since the 80s. Many people think that is a modern thing. No, it's been used since the 80s to mean a proper vegan, a vegan that follows the official definition of veganism of the vegan society, a definition that started in the 40s and was finalized in 1988. And that means it's somebody that seeks to exclude all forms of animal exploitation, not just for food, but for any any purpose. So that means it's a proper vegan. But as many people use the term vegan just to describe the diet they have, uh, the other vegans, the vegans that apply it to all aspects of their life, they thought we need to add an objective to tell us apart, and they use ethical vegan. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? 
I would add to that that veganism was founded as an ethical system. So vegan itself is ethical. That is the that's the root of it. Uh, over time, it's become a little <laughs> diluted, as Jordy says. It's become synonymous with plant based to some people, and so we do add ethical in front to remind people that veganism is ethical. But ethical mm -hmm. vegan and vegan really mean the same thing. It's based on ethics. It's based on morality, distinction of right versus wrong, whereas plant-based is just based on diet, which might be vegan, but it has no ethical component. It's just interesting what we do with language and a word that has meant something. People want to be a part of it, but they want it their way. <laughs> the same thing happened with vegetarian. Vegetarian used to mean one thing and it, and it changed over time to something else. And so that's why vegan came up. Vegetarian changed. So we have vegan. Now vegan is changing. Let's keep vegan meaning what vegan means. Yes. And the same thing with plant-based, because I think originally plant-based did mean a vegan diet. It was never really, I think, codified. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been codified. And I don't really understand personally, I don't understand what plant-based means because I had a plant-based salad that had bacon on top. It was based on plants, but there's bacon. And it's just like when we watch a movie that's based on a true story, what does it mean that it's based on plants? Oh, uh, yeah, right. For me, it's unclear. Yeah, I agree. But, but it is very years, trendy. Over the years, plant-based has come to mean the vegan diet. Okay, let's start with Tamara. Um, if you would tell me a little bit about you and your work, and then we'll jump into some of the stories we want to share today. Sure. Well, um, I champion women's rights in the workplace full time, and um, I have become a member of the National Lawyers Guild, the New York City chapter. I've been a member now for over 15 years, and the guild is really an ethical home for um, a professional like myself, a lawyer like myself. It was very welcoming. And um, in my profession, there's just quite a bit of artifice. And um, I didn't find that in the guild. I found, I found um, warmth and compassion. Mm -hmm. The guild's ethics have always placed um, the rights of people over the rights of property. And that has given it a wonderful uh, sort of backdrop to um, the Animal Rights Committee, of which I am currently chair. You had these bi-monthly meetings in New York. That's right. That's and right. How long have they been going on? Because I remember going to one or two, I think, a long time ago. When COVID hit and when Governor Cuomo told us to sort of shelter in place, there was some question among the committee members in New York, again, how, how we would continue to function as a committee and what we would do. And um, we came upon, upon the idea of these bi-monthly webinars that explore different intersections of animal rights in the law. Um, and so the one coming up on October 17th is going to deep dive into this question of ethical vegans who are discriminated against and who are doing something about it, who are fighting back through legal means. And that's why Jerry and Jordy, both of whom have done that. All right. Shall we start with Jerry and hear Hello. Jerry's story? Hi. You were a student. We're going to talk about a story that happened in the 90s. Late 90s. Late 90s. I remember hearing about it. So I'm excited to see who it was all about because I did follow it. And it was a very interesting, a very interesting case. That's all I can say about that. And and let's hear what happened to it and where we might sure. go in the future. It was an interesting case that should not have been interesting, <laughs> but it ended up being interesting as some cases go. I was a computer technician, a computer repairman, as it were, at a pharmaceutical warehouse. There were no patients. It was the warehouse of a hospital. There were no patients there. There were just pharmacists. And I had worked there for around 10 months, and they liked my work so much, they offered me a permanent full-time job, which I accepted. Uh, then after the permanent job was offered, they said that I needed to get what's called the MMR vaccine. That's against measles, mumps, and chicken pox. And uh, by that time, I think I had only been vegan for around eight or 10 years. 
I researched the MMR vaccine and found that it was cultured in chicken embryos, which means that the, the chicken embryos are, of course, the fertilized chicken eggs. And so there are hens who are mass producing these eggs as they do for every market. And uh, as an ethical vegan, as, as a vegan who is also ethical, uh, I, I didn't want to be involved in the production of uh, the vaccine. I didn't want to be injected with the vaccine. I didn't want my role in this to cause additional suffering to the chickens by taking the vaccine, no matter how small. It's just uh, an absolute no. So I informed my employer that I was not able to take the MMR vaccine as an ethical stance. And a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from management and I, uh, they told me that not only was my employment offer uh, rescinded, but I'm not even welcome there as a contractor. So I had worked there as, uh, as a computer contractor for 10 months. Um, nobody had any problem. Nobody wanted me to be vaccinated. I was just happy as a, as a vegan in a pharmaceutical warehouse and they, they kicked me out. So California has a employment law that says whenever an employee has a religious requirement, whether it's a headscarf, whether it's a Bible on the desk, or whatever the religious requirement may be, the employer has to try to accommodate the request. They have to try to integrate them. And only upon trying and failing can they remove the employee. And so my lawyer filed a lawsuit under this employment accommodation law. There's no question that Kaiser Permanente did not try to accommodate me. The question was whether veganism was the equivalent of a religion under this law. And as it was, as it was litigated, the court, the first court said it was not. The first court ruling was appealed. And this is where the uh, case to me got more interesting. Hmm. The court of appeal said that a religion normally has the, the word that I remember still is otherworldliness. Religion has to have something, some otherworldly comp component to it. The court said that while none of these individual factors are proof of a religion, we would tend to look for things like holidays and clergy and rituals. And that's what they were saying required to be religion. And since ethical veganism has none of these things that they said ethical veganism was not a religion. So under, Cal under California and United States law, that court got it wrong. There is a case that my lawyer cited from the Vietnam era when there were two atheists who had a objection to uh, to violence and they did not want to be soldiers in the Vietnam War they said that they would be medics this was their reasonable accommodation and the U.S. Army said atheism is not a religion we're not going to recognize that so they took that to the U.S. Supreme Court the U.S. Supreme Court said that the person's individual beliefs their declared religion isn't what matters they could be atheists they could be anything at all you want the question is, is that is this, the question is whether this individual value, is that something that they hold with religious conviction? And because these two atheists had religious conviction that they did not want to kill, they won that case. Hmm. And so that is the exact blueprint for my case. And my case, Court of Appeal got it wrong. We appealed this again to the California Supreme Court, the California Supreme Court uh, turned it down. Uh, essentially, they said they were too busy. When you have your second appeal, you don't get it as a matter of right. You have to ask. So we asked the California Supreme Court, and they said they were too busy, essentially. We were also then allowed to appeal it to the United States Supreme Court, and we got the same response that they were too busy. So the last court that ruled on it was the California Court of Appeal. They got it wrong, and that decision is what stands. All right. I have come up with um, like five or six things I wanted to touch on from your conversation. I'm sorry that they ruled not in your favor. The first thing I want to know is about the MMR vaccine. So if someone has had measles, mumps and chicken pox, do you have to get the MMR vaccine? Uh, so typically you will have antibodies for the rest of your life. Now, I my grandmother was a physician 
and my mother told me that I was vaccinated, but I have no memory of this. Hmm. Uh, so Kaiser did do a blood test on me and they found that I was negative on the antibodies. But still, at that time, I was probably 35, 40 years old, somewhere in that range, and I had never come down with it. It suggests I was immune. Perhaps the blood test was wrong. Perhaps it was right. I don't know. But the requirement that Kaiser had is based on me being negative for the MMR antibodies. Okay. The next question I have, this is just a silly question, but if you had wanted to keep the job, could you have pretended to be of a certain religion that wouldn't allow you to be vaccinated? I'm sure I could have been pretended. I don't. I mean, know I know result... you're an ethical person, but yeah, I'm just... I don't know that, that the result would be any different uh, because I was negative on the antibodies. And so mm -hmm. even there, they... So even there, Kaiser would have more pressure to try to accommodate, but I think the result would be the same. So, you know, as you're saying, I'm an ethical person, I'm not going to misrepresent myself, but it's likely the result would have been the same. And I hadn't even thought of anything like that at the time anyway. It's just, I just said what came to mind. Right. Okay. It's interesting. I'm not a religious person. And uh, my listeners know that. And I've had a variety of different people on this program, religious, non-religious. I welcome everybody as long as they're peaceful and loving and want to promote a whole food plant diet. You can believe in whatever you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody. But it's interesting that that otherworldly thing is a piece of it because it's okay to follow something, someone that we can't see that's outer worldly, other worldly. But if we come to something from our own intelligence, that's not okay. And it's almost like the powers that be don't want us thinking. They want to control us. Yeah. Well, ultimately the first amendment, the first amendment is uh, about the freedom of thought. We have the freedom of speech. We have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom of press. It's the freedom of thought. It just so happens that this particular lawsuit was framed under freedom of religion, but it, it really should be thought of as freedom of thought, freedom of conscience. And so because it was framed as freedom of religion, and because this nation is very thick in religion, it was just that these particular judges couldn't step out of their religious training, their religious indoctrination. And that's that's not supposed to happen it's an aberration of an opinion. There is no otherworldliness requirement. The U.S. government is not allowed to determine which religions are reasonable and which religions are not. What I mean by that is there are some theistic religions, of course, and there are atheistic religions. Buddha said that he looked inside himself and saw nobody looking back, therefore there is no God, and yet Buddhism is a religion. Confucianism is a religion, and there's no God, there's no God in Confucianism. So I was just treated poorly because I believe the indoctrination of these appellate judges as to what a religion means. I have three more things, three more comments. One is this was Kaiser Permanente who was involved in this case. Correct. And I think it was in the late eighties when they came out and were encouraging all of their physicians to promote a plant-based diet. Wasn't that around the same time? Uh, late 80s. I don't remember when they came out. No, it was 90s, remember. not 80s. It was the 90s. I yeah. do remember there was a major report by Kaiser Permanente out of Hawaii. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, to the your listeners who don't know, is a major hospital system in the United States. There was a, there was a decision, a, a recommendation that came out of the Kaiser in Hawaii for plant-based diets. But there you know, arguing on their behalf, the difference between a plant-based diet and a vegan saying they don't want a vaccine is different. And vegans have a holiday. We have November 1st, World Vegan Day. There you go. I don't know that that was put in the brief, but, you know, I recognize all sorts of holidays. Uh, Buddha was born on uh, October 2nd. I'm not Buddhist, but, you know, there are all sorts of holidays world over. There's Fur Free Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah, every day is a holiday, according to Hallmark and other people promoting their products. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and we have we don't have formal clergy either, but we have luminaries. So, you know, we have the we have the blueprint. We just don't have the same details. Well, this is a topic 
that is very important and at some point needs to go in our favor. And I'm surprised, or did something happen during the COVID vaccination period with people not wanting to be vaccinated? Now, there wasn't a necessary requirement because if you didn't get vaccinated, then maybe you weren't allowed to do certain things. But that's actually a lot more complicated because two of the COVID vaccines were plant based. The uh-huh. Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine were both plant based. And so it would be very difficult for an ethical vegan to bring up a case like mine if there are plant based options. Well, I'm glad I had the Pfizer vaccine. It, that's why I had the Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> All right. This affected the rest of your life. You decided to become an attorney. That's right. So I was a, I'll say a baby vegan at the time. Well, I was maybe eight years old. So I was a child vegan at the time. And uh, I, I got more involved in vegan advocacy and I saw more and more how vegans needed representation. I like to argue. I like to think about stuff. So I went to law school and I became an attorney. I am vastly an attorney on animal issues, uh, but I take other cases as well. I, for example, I was just informed about uh, a racial discrimination case in Southern California, still investigating it, but it has nothing to do with veganism. It still has to do with oppression of minorities. Okay, well, maybe we'll come back to some of your other cases that were highlights in your career that have to do with animal activism, but let's move to Jordy. So your issue has to do with a pension fund. You know, it's always about money. I say this program is called It's All About Food, but you know, it's connected. It's also all about money. Can you tell us your story? Sure. Uh, Well, I'm uh, in the UK, uh, which we, of course, get different laws, and and we're lucky in this respect because uh, our laws are more practical. Uh, They don't consider religion as such an important thing. We are a less religious country compared with the U- US. Uh, and so that's an advantage I had, but uh, the issue started the same thing, a discrimination against me for being an ethical vegan. In this case, it was about pensions, as you mentioned. So I, I, I'm an animal protectionist. I've always been working in animal protection for all my life in different roles for different organizations. And at one point in 2016, I was hired by an animal protection organization, the League Against Cruel Sports, an anti-hunting organization. And I was hired as the head of policy and research. And I had worked with them before, 10 years prior, so I knew them well. So I was joining them in a higher position. And in the UK, when you are hired at any organization, uh, you have to be auto-enrolled into a pension fund, a pension fund chosen by the employer. So I was auto-enrolled. And and then I checked it, of course, because I'm a vegan, I checked everything. And I noticed initially that the name was a different name than the pension fund I had 10 years before with them. Mm. And the name didn't have the word ethical. The 10 years prior, the pension fund had the word ethical and this one didn't. So I thought, no, not so strange. Let me check it out. Let me see where the money goes from this one. And then I was shocked to realize that it was going to the worst possible companies I could imagine. Pharmaceutical companies that test on animals, petrol companies, tobacco companies, the worst. I was shocked because that was an animal protection organization. That made no sense to me. So I complained straight to my uh, bosses and they were shocked well. So they blamed the previous management and they said, don't worry, we'll change that. And uh, things didn't happen. So I kept asking, I, I, I asked them not to contribute any of my percentage of my salary to the pension fund while they were sorting this out because I didn't want any penny going into a very section. And they said, fine, we'll we'll hop, we'll stop it. And then when we'll sort it out, we'll put it all together. And months passed, and I when I check with the pension provider, I realized they had not stopped it. They had still they continued contributing. I was continuing contributing to the pension fund against my will. A year passed me complaining and pressuring and a lot of excuses. Uh, and if you don't like the pension fund that, uh, that the company give you, you can change it. So you 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 have that right. So because they they were not changing it, they, they were not really doing what they said they would do. I changed it myself, and I told my colleagues that the, many of them were vegan as well and concerned as well. I told them how to do it if they wanted to change it. And because of that communication, they fired me. Uh, and that was a year after me complaining. And I thought, well, I had no choice. I have to tell them I am an ethical vegan. I'm compelled to pass the information to help people to remove their contribution to animal exploitation if they want to do so. So I had no choice. So you actually have fired me because of my belief and it's a compulsive belief. 
So I thought that ought to be illegal. So I took them to the employment tribunal. Uh, there is a law, it's called the Quality Act 2010, which luckily is much better than many of the laws in the US in this regard, because the, the, this law allows non-religious belief to be part of the discrimination to, the, to a protected class. It says that religion is a protected class, but non-religious belief uses a term philosophical beliefs are also protected. And also being an atheist, uh, you're also protected. So very specifically allows atheists and non-religious people to be protected. And I thought, well, it's, I, I'm a non-religious person. I, my belief in veganism is strong. I'm going to be automatically protected. But not, uh, I realized that although the law says that, it doesn't allow all philosophical beliefs to be protected just automatically. It has to be a system to determine which beliefs deserve protection and which should be rejected. And I think it's good because some beliefs are terrible and they should not be protected. And the system works because it has been generally selecting the right ones. And the system is composed by a judge checking the belief uh, against a series of conditions that were set, set up by an employment appeals tribunal above the employment, employment tribunal. And then if that belief fulfills all these conditions uh, and the person generally believes in that belief, then that, that belief is protected from then on. Nobody had done that with veganism or any form. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to be the first. I'm going to claim that ethical veganism is a protective belief. So I have to go through that process. And that's what happened. The judge had to look uh, on, on the veganism, ethical veganism. I presented loads of evidence, describing what it is. Uh, and in the, on the 3rd of January 2020, he ruled that yes, veganism fulfills all the characteristics of a protective belief under the Quality Act 2010, and therefore is now protected from the home. And also he said that yes, I am an ethical vegan, I, I haven't faked it, I, I, I'm genuine an ethical vegan, and therefore my discrimination case could continue. And that meant my case could go to the next phase, the what is called the full merits hearing, uh, to check whether I was indeed fired because of my belief. And that was a 10 day trial. And the, in the fifth day, we settled in my favor because it was going very well for me. Uh, and eventually I got everything I needed. I got the compensation, economic compensation. compensation. And uh, without me planning, I also got uh, this gift for all the vegans in the UK that they are now protected under the Quality Act 2010. Well, that's certainly a benefit of any case that once it happens, there's some precedent. But I'm just so curious, if this had been a banking company, a pharmaceutical company, I could understand them ignoring you. But an animal organization, it's suspicious, isn't it? Like, was, did somebody change companies when it was an ethical source pension versus not? Was somebody getting a kickback? <laughs> Yes, it's suspicious when you think of animal companies as a whole, as a single unit, but when you know about animal protection, you know there are different types. And you can divide them in two big groups, the animal welfare organizations and the animal rights organizations. The animal rights organizations are often very vegan, they promote veganism, but the animal welfare organizations don't. They often promote reform rather than abolition, and this one was one of them was an anti-hunting organization, but was not an animal rights organization and was not an abolitionist organization. Yeah. Therefore, many people there ate meat, many people there were vegetarians, they were vegans too, but they were not promoting veganism. And of course, through the years, the, the dominant group of, of uh, uh, managers were more inclined to the vegan side and others more inclined to the meat side. And, and the time they were more inclined to the meat side, they decided to change the pension fund. That's what happened. Wow. All right. Well, Tamara, hi. <laughs> Thank you for bringing these two people to me and letting us hear your story. What is the purpose of this program you're having on October 17th? Because you're going to have Jerry and Jordy and a few other people there. Well, the, the, there are several purposes. For one thing, I'm confident and my committee is confident that there are many, many people who are being discriminated against, people like us, ethical vegans, in Jordy's case, as well as in Jerry's case, what you're hearing are stories that are centered around a conflict at work. So these are these are employment conflicts, um, but there are ethical vegans who are in divorce disputes where a non-ethical vegan partner is claiming that the ethical vegan is, for example, 
um, dangerous to, for the health of the child. There are parents um, around the world who are claiming to be other than ethical vegans, for example, to be Buddhist or to be another religion just so that they could get vegetarian food uh, or vegan food for their child in nursery school. There are parents whose kids don't want to go or you know, the parents don't want the kids to go to the zoo, but the rest of the class is going to the zoo and the child is being penalized for not going to the zoo or the aquarium with the rest of the class. There are, uh, yeah, so, so this kind of issue, this problem is taking on a lot of different forms. The form that you see in front of you today is again, the employment form, but it, it covers people who are in, jail, who are in detention, who are perhaps in detention because they're an animal rights activist and they are an ethical vegan and they're not getting appropriate food for the months that they're in detention. Their detention could be because they graffitied in front of a fur store or a fur salon. Um, their detention could be because they didn't register for a parade or a rally that they were about to have. So again, lots of different places where this kind of issue can happen. And we will hopefully have several folks who are experiencing this. And I want to encourage others to think about potentially fighting for their rights and to feel like they are not alone and to feel like there is an international camaraderie of ethical vegans who are pushing this and who want to be able to go to work and have their children go to school and not have to deal with this these kinds of discriminatory cases and, and actions. I've said this before, but we live on an insane planet. And a lot that happens on this planet is insane. And some people realize it. And there are so many things that are accepted as normal and natural and good that we know are horrifying. We need lawyers on our side. More. Thank you. We need lawyers. And the, the thing is, you know, as I said before, it's all about food. It's also all about money. It's expensive very often to be represented by an attorney that is on your side because you have a lot of work to, the attorneys have a lot of work to do and you you have to you have to live yourself so it's a, a complicated situation we've got plenty of grassroots activists that are trying to move the food continuum so that we move away from animals and more towards plants but it it involves many many things and we definitely need attorneys so it's nice to meet you too as attorneys, Jerry and Tamara, and any way we can support you, at least by telling your stories, I'm happy we can do that. I'm very appreciative also, but you mentioned something that I think Jordy can respond to, and that is how an ethical vegan might find an attorney and or fund themselves. Jordy did an excellent job of that. I don't want to put you on the spot, Jordy, but go ahead. Tell them. Yes, because I'm probably representative of most uh, vegans that have been discriminated against in, in the sense that I had no money to pay my lawyers. And probably most people will feel the same. There are obviously pro bono lawyers out there, but I could not find any that would have the quality required for this case. I, I felt the responsibility was huge. If I fail, if veganism becomes a non-protective class, then all vegans will be negatively affected. So I could not just choose any lawyer. I had to choose the expensive ones, the experts in discrimination, the experts in the Equality Act. So I approached them and I realized I could not afford them. But they themselves said, but there's a way you can get the money. You can crowdfund. You can crowdfund for it. And there are these web pages called crowdjustice.com that crowdfunds specifically for legal cases. So I approached them and said, yeah, you go ahead. And so that's how I funded my case, by mm -hmm. little donations here and there from the public, also big donations from the vegan society and other organizations that realized the implications of my case, and they started to give me money. But also meant I had to go public 
I could just, uh, I could not fuck cow fine without telling the world what happens. So I mean, so I had to be involved in campaigning for my case, but luckily I've been a campaigner of my life, so I knew how to do it. And, uh, and so I was able to eventually, after two years of litigation, it lasted two years, the whole thing, to get all the enough money to pay my lawyers, my solicitor and my barrister, and to be successful in the case, but I didn't have it at the beginning. So it was an interesting adventure. And that's why I wrote the book, Ethical Vegan, which is part of it is the story of veganism as a whole. But another part is how I did it, how I managed to, my case uh, to, to get it to the end with all the obstacles that were in the middle. When did that book come out, Ethical Vegan? Came out in December 2020. So what happens is that my case ended in February 2020 and then the pandemic kicked in. So I had nothing else to do rather than write the book. So I wrote 10 hours a day constantly. So it, it came the same year that I ended my case, which is unusual. Normally it takes a couple of years to write a book like this. But it came the same year because I, that's what I did the entire time. Mm. And it covers the history of veganism, my life as a vegan, and my case. So it's an intertwine of the, the three stories. And Jerry, coming back to you, can you share with us one or two or whatever we have time for, some highlights in your career? Lots of my cases deal with free speech rights. So lots of my cases handle animal rights protesters, protesters of other types, but generally animal rights protesters who uh, follow United States law, California law, and want to protest about whatever topic. Uh, but then police typically undertrained, sometimes oppressive. They interrupt the protest. They make threats of arrest when they shouldn't make these threats. So that's a, a large amount of the cases that I take. One, let's see, one, one case I'm involved in right now, there was a 14-month protest against a, a cruel pony ride in the city of Los Angeles that took place in a public park. And this pony ride uh, also gave 25% of their profits to the city of Los Angeles. So the city was making around $250,000 a year and the, uh, the vendor was making around $750,000 a year just on exploiting these ponies. Did I, did I my, mention before it's all about money? Typically about yeah. money. Okay. <laughs> and among other things, the protesters were protesting. They were not only protesting just that ponies were be, being used anyway, because the ponies, they have their own lives to live and they don't want to be ridden by children. But uh, a veterinarian had come out and said that some of the ponies had sores under the saddles. And of course, when the kids are on the saddles, they're rubbing the sores. Some of the ponies had toenails that were overgrown. Um, they were being forced to work in the summer heat. It got to 90 degrees, close to 100 degrees sometimes. And so there are there were circumstances that anybody would think was unreasonable. And then, of course, vegans think that it's unreasonable to have the ponies there under any circumstance. So... The protesters never broke any law. They were always peaceful, but they were threatened with arrest because the police officer said they were interfering with business. Now, how can you have a protest and not be interfering? Well, how could you protest against a business and not be interfering with a business in this very loose and vague and touchy-feely term? So in California law, what it means to interfere with a business it is very narrow. One of them, one of the things you must be doing is either physically obstructing a customer uh, or an employee. You have to, there has to be some physical obstruction. And none of my clients had any physical obstructions. They would stand with a sign. If somebody happens to have to walk around somebody with a sign, that does not meet the legal definition of obstruction. Everybody was able to do everything they wanted to do. The other element that could be obstruction uh, would be uh, intimidation. And that would typically be some sort of a threat of violence or some sort of intimidation that actually makes the customer or the employee change what they're doing. In other words, you're screaming at somebody, you say you're going to hurt them, and instead of going to take a ticket, they turn around. So that is intimidation. So a lot of the customers of the pony rides told the police they were intimidated, but they still went and participated. So even if the customer thought they were intimidated, it didn't rise to the level that the law expects. So over the 14 months, several of my clients were arrested. Several of my clients were threatened with arrest. One of my clients was arrested 16 times, about once a month, 
And I went through in detail the video, the police reports of all of his arrests. Not one of them met those elements. And sometimes the police reports would say, well, the business had been closed at some point. While the business was closed, this person was standing in the ticket line. Therefore, he was blocking. And I'm just pulling my hair out. The business was closed. There is no obstruction. The business was closed. Nobody was on the ticket line. He was just standing there. So that's one of my big cases right now. Oh, it's ongoing. It hasn't been settled yet or finished. We we filed the case originally just to make the police stop the harassment. And then the city read the writing on the wall, so to speak, and they uninvited that vendor from being there. Hmm. And so that first phase of the lawsuit became moot because the the pony business went out of business and there was nothing more for us to ask the court to do. So that first phase of the business, uh, sorry, that first phase of the lawsuit is just about over. We're arguing over attorney fees right now. We prevailed. And so the city has to pay the attorneys for our time. And we're in that negotiation right now. But the second phase of the lawsuit is about to start, and that's going to be to compensate my clients for being arrested, for being harassed, for being intimidated from doing from their First Amendment rights. I have one question. Maybe you want to comment on it. Maybe you don't. But do you have thoughts on the domestic terrorism law that went into place? I think it was the late 90s, and it really was targeting animal activism. Are you... So that law was originally called the um, Amer... Yeah, I forget animal the name Enterprise of it. Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Right. It was originally called the Animal, animal Protection. Enterprise Protection Act, AEPA, uh, that was unconstitutional on its face. And then they made some changes to it, including changing the name to terrorism. So the Animal Enterprise Protection Act became the Animal Enterprise terrorism act um i knew a lot about this law some years ago i've my memory has faded on all the details now but i can tell you that on its face it is obviously targeting and targeting animal enterprise uh it's it is there to benefit any business that uh, is anywhere in the chain of commerce that involves animals and it is worded so broadly so that if you protest if you protest across state lines, so imagine you put an advertisement out on the internet and that's considered across state lines mm -hmm. against, an, against an animal enterprise and you do any economic damage. And that economic damage is so broad to say that if they buy extra security cameras because you're protesting, that counts as economic damage. Therefore, you're a terrorist. It's absurdly broad. It's only been used once that I'm aware of and it hasn't been used since, the fact that it hasn't been used since shows that the government is worried that it is unconstitutional mm. and they don't want to lose it. They don't want to use it and lose it. Right. But it is something we really should try and change. Yeah, it's on, the, it's on the books. It's on the books and it will scare some activists from being activists Which, under completely lawful conditions just because it's on the books. It needs to be taken off. Right. Okay. Tamara, any comment uh, there? Yeah, a couple. Um, some of the economic terrorism includes things like chalking on the sidewalk, includes things like sending a black fax. So we are talking about de minimis, de minimis infractions. And um, the attorney that I know who has been fighting against this Animal Inter Enterprise Terrorism Act is Odette Wilkins. Um, and she has not had success, but because the law is still on the books as Jerry rightfully says, but I know that this is her sort of, sort of a reason to etra, like this is Odette Wilkins. Um, claim to fame and focus point. Okay, well, I just have a little chills here, but I'm <laughs> I'm glad that people are out there trying to fight the good fight, Jerry and Tamara and, and Jordy. Anything you want to add before I let you go? I think this podcast would be incomplete if Jerry didn't talk about his 
success against Adidas on behalf of kangaroos. That's something that we're very active in here in New York, but Jerry had that success years ago. So do you want to mention that, Jerry? You know, ever so briefly, I was invited to join a lawsuit against Adidas. Adidas was selling kangaroo skin illegally in California. California had a law against selling anything from any kangaroo. Hmm. So Adidas had these soccer cleats with kangaroo skin. The police would not enforce it. So we had to bring a lawsuit for it. We won the lawsuit. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a much more complicated case that maybe we'll talk about another time. Ultimately, we, we won the lawsuit. Nobody would hold Adidas to account until um, an organization called Viva from the UK, actually. Uh, Viva and I uh, brought the case and, and, uh, and we prevailed. So, And I, I wanted to say for my part that there are a lot of people of conscience, whether we're vegans or other, who um, are afraid of speaking out in work. And as Tamara mentioned, if there's a a marriage dispute or a divorce dispute. There are, there are a lot of people who are afraid of these things, um, understandably. And in the United States, when you have a lawsuit of this nature, there are legal mechanisms to get the attorneys paid, which means that the individual uh, doesn't have to pay directly, but the attorney gets paid if they win. So there's always incentive for attorneys to take cases like this. Uh, even if the attorney doesn't get paid by the client, they can get paid by the other side if, if we prevail. So find a lawyer. Thank you. Find a lawyer. I always say that just being vegan is an act of courage. So yes. for all people that take that step, thank you. And and if you need a lawyer, get a lawyer. And come to the webinar on October 17th and hear about what other people are doing and how lawyers are helping them move the ball forward, not just in the U.S. and the U.K., but also in France and possibly Canada and Switzerland as well. So in all of these places, vegans are moving the legal ball forward um, on behalf of other vegans. So please do come October 17th, noon. Um, the title of the webinar is Expanding Vegan Rights, and you can find it on Eventbrite and register for free. Thank you. Okay, I'll include a link in the post for this podcast. Thank you, Karen. Thank all you right, so well, much, everyone. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you all. Thank you for joining me. That was wonderful. Well, I have such gratitude for people like Tamara and Jerry, who are lawyers, working for good this is my moment of gratitude. I want to thank everyone at the Progressive Radio Network for supporting me all these years in doing this program. It's all about food. It's definitely been a labor of love. I'm just so full of gratitude that this program was acknowledged in USA Today 10 Best. I'll include a link to that article in this podcast so you can check it out and share it, right? Share it, share it, share it. If you're new to this program, I just want you to know you can always send comments and questions to me at info at realmeals.org. I love to hear from people. I love to have conversations, community, and if I can help in any way, I will. You may also want to visit our nonprofit website that produces this show, Responsible Eating and Living, which you can find at responsibleeatingandliving.com. And there we have hundreds of recipes. All of my podcasts are archived there since 2009. And you might even discover some other interesting little things while you're checking it out. And the way I always love to end my program, I will end it again today the same way. Have a delicious week.